Good morning, Adelaide, and indeed the world. My name is Con, and I am the conversationalist. And if you haven't worked it out by now, here's my cuppa. Uh, sadly, my mug broke, so I've got a, a rather plain black one. Today, we are getting, or I'm getting, under the covers, metaphorically speaking, of course, I'm speaking to Australia's leading love and relationship expert, Dr. Love. Welcome, Dr. Love. Good morning. Thanks for having me, Con. Very Absolute, happy to be here. Absolute pleasure. With uh, you're you're a very very busy lady, and it's been six months in the making. And it I'm has. I'm absolutely thrilled with my male persistence. <laughs> Thank you for your patience. That's... I must say, <laughs> <laughs> you're most welcome, Doctor Love. First question before we get into because uh, I've got lots of people who are really really hanging on this uh, on this uh, interview. How does one decide that they're going to be a love and relationship expert? I don't know if it was actually a decision. It was almost like it just landed on my lap. Um, but for a few reasons, I, obviously, I was um, I have a background in psychology and okay. therapy and counselling, and I did that for many years. And what I found is that I worked in plenty of different, I had different niches along that way, like you do in any career, you sort mm. of venture out and try different things. So I've gone from educational um, to an educational setting, to a forensic setting, uh, to, you know, a, a therapy setting. And what I realized on that journey is that every single person that I dealt with that had some sort of dysfunction or uh, flat feeling or low mood had an issue with a relationship in their life mm. and not necessarily a current relationship it could be a relationship uh, from the family they came from the family they're in now uh, a sibling a colleague whatever it was there was some type of uh, either dysfunction toxicity um, hurt among a type of relationship that has driven their behavior and so through that and a lot of my work I realized that for me to make an impact anywhere in the world, um, and I was very much into leadership and business as well in the corporate world, I thought the best way I could be a leader right here, right now for me, while I trek, you know, the earth while I'm alive, <laughs> is to actually look at relationships mm. because they were the one contributing factor that led people astray. Okay. And... I found in, my, in, in a lot of my therapy, I eventually started to tackle these relationships that people were, ha were having that weren't working in their lives. So whether it's children with parents, whether it's adults that still have, you know, deep-seated issues around their own parents, whether it's a, a, a toxic relationship between two adult individuals or a toxic work environment, once we started to chip away at that, I, I noticed the what it did for the individual in their life, mm. the quality of life they just they started to have and so then it became almost like my niche so then I started to deal with these relationships and then all of a sudden I've got couples coming to me and they're all like hey you're apparently the relationship guru can we see you and then all of a sudden I'm like working with couples and people in all areas of relationship okay and I sort of sat in that space and then it grew on me and I got some radio work and some media work. And they were like, you know what? You're like the love doctor. Yeah. And it stuck. And so then I became Dr. Love and that's where I'm at. <laughs> right. And what a great story. And I love the name. I mean, you couldn't, you couldn't make that stuff up, could you really? <laughs> Dr. Love, uh, let, me, let me get straight into this and, and let's bring some value to, uh, to I know uh, the audience is really looking for. One of the challenges that, that uh, individuals face is uh, a stagnant relationship. You know, they've been married for, for a long period of time or it's a long-term relationship. Life's got in the way. Kids, business, uh, the ladies put on a lazy 50 kilos, the husband's no oil painting. Intimacy is a long-gone memory. Yep. Where do you start? How do you... I guess, ask or where, do, where does that thing start and go, hey, how can we be intimate again? I think intimacy on that journey is probably not the priority, right? Because if you have a listen to some of those questions that you threw at me just then, mm. it was everything else was a priority but the relationship. Mm. 
Okay. okay. And so I always talk about relationships like business, the relation, the business of relationships. Okay. And mm. if you are going to run your business and not make it particular parts of that business a priority or you don't invest time in that business or money or energy, normally the business, you know, gets shut down and it doesn't work. It's not not profitable. Mm. So it's not worth staying open. And relationships are the same. If you have spent many years with everything else being a priority and your the business of your relationship hasn't been, this is a scenario that you find yourself in is right. that you haven't invested in anything. And so you don't end up having a relationship. It's almost like you become, you cohabitate, you know, you've got a flatmate mm. and the difference between a flatmate and an intimate partner or someone in a relationship is that you're best friends with intimacy. That's the mm. difference, right? So if you are in a relationship and you don't have intimacy, well, then you've just got a friendship. Okay. Okay. So the one thing to do is, first of all, it's a decision. Con. It, you decide that the relationship is a priority. And it's not that you don't start with the intimacy. You start with the decision that, hang on a minute, I now know that this has not been a priority and I decide to make it a priority. And when you make that decision, then the other things unfold. How do we make it a priority? It's almost like your business plan. Mm. Do we, um, how do we reconnect? Because you can't go from being disconnected to jumping in the sack together every day. Sure. It doesn't work. I mean, as much as we'd like it to, mm. to be that way, it doesn't work. There's almost like baby steps that need to happen for mm. us to build that relationship again, because let's face it, it's, you've been separated intimately and you've been separated emotionally and psychologically that you've got to rebuild that. You've got to learn what each other like. Like, what do you like now? Mm. If you've been together for 10, 15 years, what you liked at 24 mm. is not necessarily what you like at 40. Yeah. And so you really got to get to know each other again. And that means through experiences, through time, learning each other's love language. And if you don't know each other's love language, find out mm. because mm. you may have had a love language at 20 were, that were, you know, uh, gifts. You know, you wanted, you wanted, you, you received love by people buying you flowers or a box of chocolates and you felt special. But at 40, maybe that doesn't mean the same yep. to you. So is it acts of service and do you need your partner to do little things around the house or do you need them to pick up after you and that's going to make you feel appreciated? So you've got to relearn what we're like, uh, what we're like right now because what happens is that we get stuck in the idea of, oh, but that's how they used to be or yeah, that's what they yeah. used to like, right? Yeah. Well, yeah, they used to, but they're not that person anymore. Mm. And whether we like it or not, we're not. We evolve, we grow, we learn, and we change. Mm. And so I would say make the decision. The first yeah. thing to do is to make the decision. Decide that it's a priority. And the second thing is rather than go, okay, I want to have more sex, you know, because that's, you know, we're not having enough. It's how do I get to know you so then we can make love? Yep. Not the answer I was expecting. <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> but no, 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 no. That's what this is all about because th there is your concept or the first comment you made looking at your relationship as a business. It's, it's, it rings so true. We, we let things go. We don't pay them the respect or the time that we should. And then we're surprised at what the end result is. Yeah, right. And we and we and we shouldn't be. <laughs> and, and you know, the blokes get this. When I talk about relationships like a business, they go, Oh, that's easy. Right? Because they're like, Oh, hey. right, that makes sense. Yeah. Okay. Mm. So relationships don't need to be another language. It's not mm. like foreign. It's you put the time and effort in, you get a return on investment. Investment. Right? That's, that's just how it works. That's it. So, you know, and you know, we're talking about slow gains here, right? Mm. We're not talking about we're going for a risky investment. We're going yeah, slow yeah. and steady wins the race. And that's yep. very much Adelaide, right? You buy a property, <laughs> you know you're not going to lose. You sit on it and it slowly increases. I promise you, when you start to invest in your relationship, right. the sex slowly increases, um, right? <laughs> fantastic. Blokes, are you listening out there? Are you are you listening? Um just very quickly talking about property, uh, I actually had the pleasure of interviewing uh, Bronte Manuel, who's uh, head of uh, sales at Toop and Toop. 
And there is no slow growth here, Dr. Love. Not it at is, the moment. I'm on the market. off the charts. I am beside myself. Mm. Adelaide, what has happened yeah. over the last six, mm. ma- six months? The demand and supply are totally not equal at the moment. Yeah, yeah. way out of yeah. kilter. Unbelievable. Um, way out of kilter. Anyway, let's get back on this. So you've really covered, I had three questions, but you've really, really covered them in, in one response. So, so I thank you for that because that gives me the opportunity to ask you more questions and get right. and really provide more value. Uh, I was at my regular Toastmasters meeting uh, the other the other night, and I always take the opportunity to gratuitously plug my podcast. <laughs> and of course, when I mentioned I was interviewing, had the pleasure to interview Australia's leading love and relationship expert, the guys were queuing up to ask questions. I love the blokes. <laughs> and 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 one of them, one of them, which you know I didn't expect this. <clears throat> he said, "Can you please ask Doctor Love the impact of social media in relationships?" Right. Like, how is it impacting? Now, I know that's a really, really broad question, and and maybe I'll give you a little bit of uh, a bit of guidance. I was out uh, a couple of years ago dinner, and uh, I was with a friend, and there were two tables very in very close proximity. Couples in their forties, and they didn't put their phones down to put food in their mouths. Mm-hmm. So tell me what you see. Well, there's there's a couple of, uh, if you're talking about how has social media impacted dating, like as in trying to find somebody, Mm -hmm. or you're talking about how is social media or even access to phones um, impacting the way we interact with each other. There's probably two areas there, right? And and, and actually, you're very, very astute. There there were, in fact, two questions, and and I guess that's where I was going to get to. But so let's perhaps address the the, um, uh, relationship and the the phone's access firstly. So the interaction, so whether it's you're on social media, what's happened is that these things are so accessible that we can find out things right now. Mm. So we we have literally become such a selfish society that we are not able to sit on something for longer than five minutes to find out after dinner because everything is so available. So this immediate gratification, yeah. I think something I need to know now. I've asked a question to somebody five minutes ago, I need to wait for the response right now. And then there's some type of, um, I guess, uncomfortable feeling if you don't get a response straight away because why are they not you know getting back to me straight away I texted Mm. them like 10 minutes ago (laughs) and so (laughs) you know you're in you're at dinner and you're dating or you're even with your wife or Mm. with your children or whatever relationship you have and I will say to you it's the I go back to run your relationships like you run your business if you are in a business meeting you put this down you put it on silent and you don't answer because that meeting is important, whether it's you're closing a deal, whether you're networking, but it's important for you to be totally present at that meeting. So why wouldn't you give your wife, your girlfriend, your sibling, your child the same benefit, the same presence? It's a choice. And so we really need to start to really appreciate the relationships around us because what's happening is that we're becoming so distracted by whatever it is in front of us, whether it's the news, whether it's social media, whether it's the texting, that we're actually losing connection with one another. Mm. We're becoming quite a, you know, an isolated society because we can sit at home or we can have dinner and still not interact and feel like we've had dinner. Yeah. Um, and then people walk away from that experience going, oh, he was okay. But how much attention did you give him? Or how much attention did you give her really? You probably put down the phone for 10 minutes and then you're saying, you know, I'm not sure if I like him or her. Well, you weren't even present enough to make that decision. It, it, it's an interesting point. You talk about presence and and I, I've been guilty of it in the past. Yep. Where you say, oh, you know, have you spent time with your kids? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was, yeah, spent time with my kids or spent time with my partner, but you weren't really present. Yeah. Like the kid yeah. was there, he was playing with the toys and you were watching television. So you might have been babysitting, but you weren't present. Con, I see it yeah. all the time. Mm. My kids walk around like this, picking up a school bag, 
picking up a dinner table, like a plate. I'm like, hey, buddy. Hello. Like, <laughs> do you actually, can you see what you're doing? Mm. Like put the phone down and grab your school bag. Mm. Walk to the bus stop. They want to cross the road and pick up their phone to see who texted. You're crossing the road, right? Get off the phone. So it's just, it, it's culturally become just the norm. It's like having a right hand. You've always got a phone in it. Yeah. So I would say definitely make a conscious decision around what experience are you looking for? You know, is this dinner date? Really, do you want to be present? Do you want to feel something? Do you want to feel, um, you know, walk away from the dinner date feeling like you've had a connection? Or mm. do you want to just walk away like you've just watched something on the phone that you could have done at home and had no interaction whatsoever? And what people don't realise is that the lack of interaction and the lack of presence also creates a lot of other stuff. And that's like isolation, low mood, a bit of anxiety, and we're going down the road of depression, you know, mm. feeling like I'm not being able to connect with people. And so there's there's a lot of other stuff that come up if you're not spending time connecting with people. We are relative beings. We are yeah. made to connect with people. Um, and that's not always behind a screen. Yeah. We're kinesthetic. We have feeling. Yep. We need to touch. We need to feel. And that's how we're built. Mm. So we're denying what we're born with. Absolutely. Absolutely. And, and then the second point, uh, as you alluded to, with from a dating perspective, you know, back in the old days, as my kids tell me, when dinosaurs roamed the earth. Um, the good old days. It's the, the good old <laughs> days. You know, you, you met somebody uh, at, yeah. you know, work or wherever, and you went out and you got to know them. You, you saw how they interacted socially. Yep. The internet now, you know, whether it's uh, Bumble or um, yeah. Tinder or whatever the heck it is, you look at the profile and you don't actually know what you're buying, do you? Well, no, because everyone's sort of advertising themselves. It's a little bit like advertising a product, you know. Mm. You think you know what you're getting because they spend so much time and money on marketing and advertising. Mm. But you probably don't really know the ingredients, right? Looks pretty, <laughs> you know, might taste okay. You don't always know what's inside, right? So marketing's yeah. marketing regardless if it's dating or, you know, you're selling something on the shelves mm. at Woolworths. But I will say to you, online dating and, you know, a dating app, it does have its place because it is the it is the way of the world right now. Sure. And I think what we struggle with is the idea of that's but that shouldn't be. And it's that we keep we keep having these conversations, but we shouldn't have to date that way. Or it never used to be that way. What happened to good old fashioned dating? But that's exactly what it is. It's good old fashioned dating, right? It's not it's not current. And so I have a lot of people come up with the struggle of rejecting the idea of jumping online or going on an app because they're like, I don't date, I don't online date. Okay, then what type of dating you do? A none? Because <laughs> well, you don't go out and then you don't jump on, a, on an app or an online and then you ask, why am I single? Single. Um, because they don't just fall on your lap watching Netflix, buddy. Mm -hmm. Like you've got to at some point put yourself out there. And so what online dating has given us is another platform but it's also created a what we would call a disposable dating scene yeah is that you can easily swipe or you can meet up and then never speak to that person again mm. and so in good old-fashioned dating terms normally we would meet people that are part of a a social circle we know or a family and you would see them at functions or you would see them at a wedding or you'd see you know, someone would know someone. Yeah. Yeah. And so you wouldn't, you know, you wouldn't be an ass to them. Like you would be, you know what, it's not working. Sometimes the families would speak to you and your parents would speak to their parents, you know, like you wouldn't just ghost them because you'd be embarrassed because you've got to face them in the next couple yep. of weeks or the next couple of months. So you would say, you know what, it's not working. It's not for us. You'd be a decent human being and have a conversation. Mm. Whereas what's happened now with social media is that they don't have to have that conversation. They just go swipe, block, ghost, never see them again. Right. So that is something that happens. But you know what? Think of it as a blessing because you know very early that that's not the person for you. Right. So rather than take it to heart, oh my God, he doesn't like me or she's ghosted me. So thank God they've ghosted me. I'd rather know now than in six months' time. 
Because that's what people get caught up on is, oh, my God, he goes to me. Everyone on social media, everyone on these apps are are, are disastrous. I don't want to have anything to do with it. And they stay single for a long time. Mm. You, the point about ghosting and going, you know, thank God they've they've really shown their colours, so to speak. Yeah. yeah. One of the things that I see uh, with you know some of my friends is that they have their self esteem is at such a low point for for a variety of reasons, whether it's a previous relationship or you know whatever's going on in their lives, and they then take the fact that they've been ghosted and rather than looking at it and going, Hey, true colors have been shown. They've take it as what's wrong with me. Yeah. Yeah. Yep. hundred percent. Yeah. And so the real challenge for them is working on their self-esteem, their value to value themselves. So is, is that the advice that, that you would give someone? Yeah. Look, anyone that's going in the dating game, whether it's, you know, meeting in a pub or, you know, online needs to be ready for a relationship. Okay. Mm-hmm. And the, the people that get offended by the ghosting or the people that get offended by, you know, um, somebody saying something they don't like or not matching with them are the people that are actually desperately trying to find the one. The one. Right. <laughs> so, they're, the so, right so they're <laughs> caught up on oh, my God, this he could be the one or, oh, she's great, she could be the one. And they're so caught up in that idea of if this person's the one, then I'm going to be happy forever and we could, like, live happily ever after and they've, they've spoken for two or three weeks and this expectation of what this person needs to be for them. They are the people that get hard done by on social media or on um, dating apps because their expectation is so high. And so what I say to Mm. everyone that jumps online or even meets out at a bar or a pub or at a party is don't go looking for the one. You go on these apps, you go on online, you go out to a party, you get curious. Mm, I love that. You don't go fishing for the one because you are going to be hurt. You are going to be very disappointed and probably take it to heart and feel like I'm not good enough. There's something wrong with me. Yeah, yeah. There's nothing um, wrong with you. The no. only thing that might be out is your expectation of what you're expecting to find. But if you're getting curious and you're asking questions, getting yep. to know people, you know, the more people you know, the more likely you're, you're going to meet somebody. Yeah. Like if you're just curious, then you take away the expectation that if they don't call you next week, it's okay. If- one door closes, another door opens. And, yes. uh, and I said to somebody this morning, you say uh, no, and what that is doing is creating space to be able to accept something better. Yeah, and, like, not yeah. everyone likes to hear no. I understand no, that. Oh, yeah. You know, it doesn't always feel comfortable. No. <laughs> but you've got to, if you are not attached to the outcome, and this is probably the trick to online dating and any type of dating, is don't be attached to the outcome. Go for the journey. Yeah. Because you and I know that we've probably had families around us that have been in a marriage for 20 odd years thinking they're going to be the forever person and they're not. And no. they were definitely attached to the outcome. This is my forever person, but things have changed. Mm. So mm. never be attached to the outcome because what happens, it takes away from being present and enjoying the journey. Yeah. Yeah. I love that. Mm. I love that. Um. So let's long term uh, long term relationships. And I actually saw you on um, on a current affair. Um, you were involved in in a, a, a ladies' workshop, um, which I found quite interesting about advising them. You know, when is the right time? What process should they go through? You know, they've come out of a long term relationship, whether their partner's passed away or um, you know things have happened. Yeah. What's your advice? When when is the right time? What what process should they go through? You know, Con, there's never, it's not a one size fits all. Because mm. if you have to think about it, at the end of a relationship, some people, depending on the relationship, well, most people have already grieved the relationship why they're in it. So, you know, people have already started to maybe let go three, four, five years 
before the relationship actually ends. And so what happens for those people is they get out of these marriages or long-term relationships and they meet someone within, you know, 12 months or Mm. nine months. And this person is like, wow, like this is the love of my life. And then there's no real time around that. That's just felt right for that person. Then you get people that might lose somebody through death or illness or sickness and their grief might be different. And I know like from my heritage being European is that, Mm. you know, I see aunties and my grandmother that would never, ever decide to be with anyone else after their partner passed away. Mm. Yeah. It's like, no, that was my husband and I will never look at another person again. So for 40 odd years or 45 odd years, I think when I look back now at one of my family members, they have never moved on. They have never been able to have a companion because when their partner died, that's it. My heart was with them. It's like, I can never love again. So there's no real rule around this. I think what keeps us small around this con is the people around us, society. Okay. Is the, she shouldn't move on that quickly. Yeah. How could he move on that quickly? How dare he? They just divorced two years ago, or she just passed away six months ago and he's found a companion. It's really no one's business. Uh, Everyone processes their emotions differently. And if somebody wants a companion through, you know, their their pain and their grief or they've sparked up a relationship, who are we to judge? That's that's, uh, herein lies the the majority of issues on a raft of uh, uh, subjects. We're so concerned about what other people think and what the societal norm expectation is. And being European myself, in case you hadn't worked it out. Uh, with a name like Con, I'm not with sure. A, <laughs> with a name like Con. <laughs> I, I saw, you know, as I was growing up, uh, ladies who, you know, friends of family and things like that, where their partners passed away and they would be wearing black yep. for 20 years. Yeah. Every single day. Yep. And I used to say to my mum, mum, Why? Why are they still wearing black? Oh, because, you know, that's what you've got to do. Yeah. Yeah. That's heavy to carry around that, to not only wear black, to feel black, to have a heavy heart. And if you don't, there's this massive guilt of you've done something wrong. Mm. You didn't, you you didn't really like, how could, as you said before, love him. how could you, it's been 20 years for goodness sakes. You didn't love him. You mustn't have really cared about him. Mm. Um, so all of that judgment, you know, steers a lot of this behavior. And I would say, why don't we ask the person like, are you happy? <laughs> like, are you happy? You know, you might have 30 odd years left, 40 years left in you. Like, are you happy? Does this make you happy? Are you a better human being because of it? Mm. And if the answer is yes, leave them alone. Leave them alone. Leave them alone. Again, kind of off subject, but you just see it all the time, and I'm sure you see it as well, um, where people are just, they're so preoccupied with imposing their beliefs and their guilt on another person without really having any level of empathy for where they are and, you know, are they happy? I mean, it's the, you're right. It's the first question. Are you happy? If you're happy, kudos to you. Good luck to you. And Con, it's in, it's inbuilt in us. We are born. Mm. And from the minute we are born, we are programmed on what is good and what's not good. We, you know, yeah. our environment, like we're, we're born a bit of a blank slate. I'll say a mm. bit because some things happen in utero usually. Yeah, but, yeah. you know, we're, we're born almost a blank slate. And from the minute we're born, we are totally programmed. And depending on where you are, what family you're born into, we are, we're, that happens all the time. Yeah. So it's becoming aware enough that to understand the programming that's gone on for us through our history And being almost subjective to say, I understand where it comes from, but it actually doesn't work for me. Mm. And and being okay with that. Because if we can own that, then we don't feel so guilty. Mm. If you can explain to someone, I understand that's how they've always done it or that's been our tradition, but you know what? This, that doesn't work for me. And I really want to be happy. I'm a better, better parent. I'm really good with my kids. I'm in a better place. Most people will go, oh, 
then they'll start to understand. But a lot of us have a shame around owning that bit. So if we're really comfortable with it and owning it, people will come around, but we tend to hide it. I've got clients that yeah. are hiding that they've moved on and their relationship ended 15 years ago and they're still hiding it. Like put it uh, everywhere, <laughs> put it everywhere. You know? I was going to say, yeah, there's, there's a joke about, uh, about a priest asking a guy, you know, why are you telling me, son? He said, I'm telling everybody, father. Um, and, uh, and, and you're right. I know people in exactly that same situation. Yeah. Um, why are you hiding it? You know, yeah. I, I can't imagine. I can't imagine the burden yeah. that a, an individual would be carrying around the weight that they would have. Yeah. In in that situation, trying to hide something. Um, yeah. I, I I can't imagine it. Um, Doctor Love, I've had an absolute ball. This is exactly uh, what I what I hoped this would be a, a <laughs> conversation. Uh, you've been an absolute champion. Uh, I love that you've taken the time to uh, to share with our listeners. I hope that I can entice you back, and it's been a good experience for you, and I can get you back in uh, in six eight months or or whatever. We'll put you on the waiting list. You'll put me. <laughs> <laughs> I'm, I'm my apologies, Connor. It's been hopeless. It's been a crazy few months. On the yeah. waiting list. That's okay. Yeah. You know, you know what? I'm I'm happy to go on a waiting list. Not a problem in the world. Uh, Dr. Love, thank you so, so much. It's been an absolute pleasure. Ladies and gentlemen, listeners, my name is Con. I am the conversationalist. And until next time, bye for now.